My name is Katie. I'm currently studying Natural Sciences at Murray Edwards College, Cambridge. I've just finished my second year of the course and I've chosen to specialise in chemistry. So today I'm going to talk about the interview structure from when I applied three years ago for Physical Natural Sciences and then go through an example question so you can see what kind of level they're expecting you to be at and what the best way is to answer this question. So when you apply for Natural Sciences you should specify on the SAQ form whether you, you are applying for physical natural sciences or biological natural sciences. Um, this doesn't actually limit you once you get to Cambridge. You can still change your mind later, but it's more to decide what kind of interview structure they decide to give you. So I applied for physical natural sciences. Therefore, I had two interviews with my college. This does vary between colleges, though. But for mine, I had a physics-based interview and a chemistry-based interview. My physics-based interview was with me, at my physics supervisor and a material science supervisor. And they mainly went through more mathematical questions. I didn't have to sit an official maths test, but they brought along with them a list of maths questions on a piece of paper, which was laid out in a very similar way to a test. And I worked through the questions with them, and they could basically see how I thought about, thought through questions on a maths test. Uh, we then discussed a few things with my personal statement and um, a couple of more questions based on more physics-based topics. Um, so the second interview I had was um, with a chemistry supervisor and a geology supervisor. And this obviously covered mainly chemistry questions, a few geology ones, and they also asked a couple of biology-related questions, which were to do with my personal statement. The chemistry interview didn't contain nearly as much maths. It was a lot more about how I understood chemistry. There were some diagrams I had to draw or interpret. There were some graphs, there were some data. And they wanted to see that I could both remember a lot of stuff from A-level chemistry, but apply it to different situations and actually understand the reasoning behind it. So now to an example question. This was a question I was given in my chemistry interview. And I believe it's actually quite a popular question between different colleges, as I've heard other people having similar questions too. It's actually a reasonably simple question. Explain the trends in bond length and bond dissociation energy for the halogens and explain why fluorine doesn't fit the trend. Um, they don't expect you to remember exactly what the trend is, which gave me a table of data um, which stated the bond energies and the bond lengths for each of the molecules of interest. I've drawn out this table again for you. Um, it looks like this. Um, you don't need to look into too much detail into the numbers. All they want to see is that you can understand the trend and explain the chemistry behind this. So the first thing I did, obviously, look at the data and visually think about how this would look on a graph. How would you visualise this? So if you think about how it looks on a graph, quite simply, the bond length for fluorine is 143, which so is quite small, and it increases all the way up to iodine at 266. And it's a reasonably linear increase. So the first part of the question is explain the trend in bond length. And this was actually very simple. The atoms are bigger, and so the molecule must be bigger. Um, but the more challenging bit of this question was the second half of the question, about the bond dissociation energies. So this isn't a perfectly linear trend. For iodine to chlorine, there is a quite steady increase. So as you could go down from chlorine down to iodine, the bond dissociation energy decreases. This makes sense when you think about the bond length, the first part of the question. Often a question with several parts you can use earlier bits of the question to help you in later bits of the question. So we knew that from the first half of the question that the bond lengths were increasing, and so it makes sense that the bond dissociation enthalpy is decreasing because atoms are further apart, and so it's easier to break the bond. But the really hard bit is what happens with fluorine? Because fluorine actually has a lower bond dissociation enthalpy than chlorine, which doesn't fit the trend. It should be higher. It's coming back down to the size of the atoms. Fluorine is a very small atom, and so when you push it really close together, there are interactions between all the electrons around each of the, the atoms. Um, whereas in iodine, for example, they're much further apart, and so any repulsive forces between the electrons is not significant enough to really affect the bond dissociation energy. But for fluorine, the two atoms are very close together. So you think about the, the diagram you often draw at A level of the halogens, where you draw dots and crosses around the edges of each atom, you can see that the, the 
Electrons on each of the atoms are quite close together and they can repel. And this repulsive force means it's actually easier to break the bond than you would expect. And therefore the bond's association energy is lower. So when you look at it that way, actually it's quite a simple question. You have to break it down into different parts and then think logically through each of the questions.